This time we've come to Nintendo Power 38 for July of 1992, and we've got a really big game for the SNES to, to start off this issue, or rather, on the cover of this issue, and a bunch of not insignificant other ones. Let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Street Fighter 2. That's right, the fighting game revolution has begun, and it's heralded by Guile doing a kick, but not a flash kick. This is pretty good art. Now, while I missed the cover dioramas between this cover and the Lemmings cover last issue, I'd say Nintendo Power's more conventional cover art is improving dramatically. In our letters column this issue, we have readers touting, my words, not theirs, the Super Nintendo doing what Genesis Saint. That sounded better in my head. Starting off the NES section, we have our first game, Panic Restaurant, a Taito platformer related to food. It feels like the Pac-Man 2 version of Burger Time, except Burger Time was a Data East joint instead of a Taito game, and Pac-Man 2 was an adventure game instead of a platformer, but you get what I mean, a significant a genre shift between the two titles, while staying in the same franchise. Anywho, we have maps of the whole game. Panic Restaurant is a late-era NES platformer that has basically worked out all the kinks. The developers have figured out the right amount of difficulty for an NES platformer, how to do the controls, how to design boss, pla boss patterns, everything. It's a game that's pretty much near perfect. If I had a complaint, it's that the coins you collect as you go through the game is tied to a random slot machine at the end of each level, and that you don't fill up your health to max after you beat a boss. Instead, how much your health increases is based on the results of that slot machine draw at the end of the level. This is aggravated by some very cheap hits in levels, particularly when you're coming into contact with enemies on narrow platforms at the top or bottom of ladders. Or just drop-offs where you can't necessarily attack downwards to get them. Otherwise, the game has unlimited continues, which means that with a little time and patience, you can make your way through the game at a reasonable pace. It's definitely a game that I'd be willing to pick up if I found an affordable copy. Next is Capcom's Gold Medal Challenge. And being that this is in 1992 and the Summer Olympics are happening in Barcelona, I'm assuming Capcom tried to actually get the official Olympic license, but things fell through. Anywho, the article gives a rundown of the various events in the game and in what programs they fall into. <clears throat> Capcom's Gold Medal Challenge has a lot in common with other track and field games I've covered thus far. And that's ba basically a collection of mini-games with a sports theme, played either against the computer or against a fellow human, and you generally can't win against the computer even if you're using Turbo on your controller. Thus, this is a game that is generally more fun played against another human, which causes me a problem because I'm playing these games solo. That said, it does a lot of things better than earlier track and field games. The game lets you save your progress and lets you continue with the full sequence even if you fail to qualify. That said, this title doesn't handle the events very well. If you do well enough to qualify, that's all well and good, but unless you're in the top three in your initial run, it doesn't matter because you don't get a second heat. At which point, why bother having a qualifying time because you're not actually qualifying for anything? There's just the one heat, all you're trying to do is get in the top three, and making the qualifying time doesn't indicate that that's going to happen. Anyway, the game generally plays well, and the controls are good, but unless you have someone else to play against, I can't recommend picking this up. We've covered ports of PC RPGs before with the Wizardry games. This time, we've got another with Might and Magic. The article gives a rundown of the game mechanics, along with a map of Sorpigal, the first city in the game, and the catacombs beneath the city. Now, I've previously written about this game for Hardcore Gaming 101. Might and Magic for the NES is, on the one hand, probably the most approachable version of this game. 
has a built-in auto map. Thieves are more likely to disarm chests. Full text is given for the name of spells rather than having to reference the manual. And there's music and there's color and there's textures to the graphics instead of the more plain wireframe wizardry-esque walls of the cities and dungeons in the original game. The only really significant thing that the PC versions of Might and Magic have over the console versions is that there is no way to carry your characters over from Might from this game to Might and Magic 2. Now understand why it is impossible to carry your characters over. Might and Magic 2 was released for the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis instead of the NES, and I believe it was ported by different companies as well, so you can't do a password progression thing like what happened with um, Golden Sun 1 and 2 on the Game Boy Advance. Unfortunately, Might and Magic for the NES is really freaking expensive, as even a loose copy of the game, at least the US version, tends to go for around $40 or $50. So if you want to get the game at a reasonable price, something where you can just buy it for fairly affordable, your only real option is to get the DOS version through GOG. Otherwise, you'd be forking over about as much as a full-priced game now in order to pick up this game. Loose. That said, the DOS version plays on pretty much every everything, thanks to DOSBox, so whether or not you can play it on your computer is not too much of an issue. Heck, you can probably play it on your Android tablet, for that matter. We've come through the conclusion of Nintendo Power's fourth year, so it's time to look back at a selection of passwords for various games that have been covered over the magazine's history. And that's pretty much it for this retrospective article. In the classified information column, the best tip of the issue is for Pipe Dream. Specifically, the tip that gives you a way where you can pause the flow of goop when things let Harry, but still lay pipe so you can get caught up with the situation. Feels like cheating. In The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past comic, Link receives Zola's mask and takes on Gliok. Moving into Game Boy games, we have a game based on the short-lived cartoon, based on one of Troma's most successful franchises aside from Attack on the Killer Tomatoes, specifically Toxic Crusaders. We get maps of episode one of the game and notes on the next five episodes. Toxic Crusaders plays like a bad version of Kung Fu. You make your way through the level, going from left to right, attacking enemies with ranged attacks, and enemies spawn almost endlessly depending on where you are on the level, and you have to quickly turn to the left or right to manage opponents. This on its own would not be a problem. Kung Fu is classic for a reason. However, what is a problem is some of the issues with the level design. Your character cannot walk up gradual inclines. You have to jump up them. Objects and environments that block shots are incredibly arbitrary. Sometimes sandbags will block shots, sometimes they won't. And there isn't anything to signal if they'll block shots this time unless they have some sort of escalating difficulty as you proceed through levels, where as you get to the later portions of the level, sandbags will no longer block shots, the same way that enemies will learn to crouch later on in the level. Further, the invincibility period that you get after hitting an enemy with ranged shots is really generous, and you come across that kind of enemy so frequently that if you run into ones who are shooting ranged shots themselves, that you are going to end up taking a cheap hit. Consequently, as a game, this is almost competent, but it's not quite there. It has a whole bunch of issues that prevent it from being enjoyable, so I have to say that you need to skip this lame cash grab. Continuing with the Game Boy titles that have licenses attached to them, we have Jeep Jamboree, which is a off-world racing game with a first-person perspective, as with Days of Thunder. We have maps of each of the tracks on the short, intermediate, and championship seasons. I don't like first-person perspective in my racing games in general. I don't use it in Forza, I don't use it in Grid, and I didn't use the hood cam perspective on Gran Turismo. There's a reason for this. When you're driving a car, there's a whole bunch of visual inputs that you get when driving that you don't get from the camera perspective in those games. You have your mirrors and you have your peripheral vision. Console racing games may give you a rear view mirror, and maybe, if you have a second analog stick controlling your point of view, or you have track IR, you might get your side mirrors. However, unless you're playing on a PC with three monitors, you're not going to get peripheral vision. Jeep, Jeep Jamboree can't even give you mirrors. You have a first-person perspective and no real peripheral visions. I will give it this over Days of Thunder. The tracks have much more visual detail to help you figure out where you are on the track, 
as opposed to the utterly blank wireframe environment that we had for Days of Thunder. Also, Jeep Jamboree has rises and dips in the track, which is also rather impressive. However, the lack of perspective, combined with the lack of feedback over how much damage you have or haven't taken, makes the game not worth playing. Next up is Wave Race, and it's interesting to note that the franchise that began its life on the Game Boy would go on to have a launch title on the N64 and one of the most beloved titles on that system outside from, you know, Mario and the Zelda games. And GoldenEye and Perfect Dark, but you know what I mean. Anyway, the article give note, gives notes on the engine classes and strategies for winning races. Wave Race is a game that feels like a mix of a top-down arcade racing game like Super Off-Road and a sprint-style arcade racing game like OutRun with some tweaks for portable play. The game puts you through either a rally course or a circuit track depending on your racing mode that you're going with, with the player having to complete each course in their series and scoring points on where they place in the top four. However, on each lap you have a time limit for the amount of time that you have to complete that lap or reach the next checkpoint and that time limit is reset when the lap is completed. Failure to complete a lap on time means you're disqualified from the race. On the one hand, this is an interesting mechanic. If you end up too far behind on a race, it just creates a situation where the race has ended, rather than you having to go through running a course you just can't win. On the other hand, you can bump into other racers, and if you go through a turn on the wrong side, you have to redo that turn, which can mean running out of time for that lap or that checkpoint. If there was a way to avoid that issue, I would say that this would be a much better game. Still, it's certainly one of the best racing games on the Game Boy that we've gotten thus far, and I admit that it is damning with faint praise. The Game Boy is getting another arcade port of another game that was controlled with a tar trackball with Centipede. Well, the good news is, this is a pretty decent port of Centipede. The bad news is, is that this game gives absolutely nothing new to the formula, which is actually a problem. In arcades, you have the ability to compare your high scores against others in the arcade. Here, there's no way to share your high score. You can play two-player with a link cable, but it's not like you can pass a high score chart from Game Boy to Game Boy. Although, now that I think about it, that would have been really, really cool if someone had done that back in the day. In Super Mario Adventures, the princess and Luigi's rescue of Mario goes remarkably well, all things considered. In Counselor's Corner, we have tips for finding the bracelet and beating Loki in Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Next up is an article titled Digital Power, which is another informative article, this time focusing on the use of rotoscoping and digitized images in video games. Sadly, we don't get any preview coverage of Mortal Kombat, nor is Pit Fighter mentioned. However, Out of This World and Prince of Persia are, which probably is better. Moving into SNES games... We have an article covering the home port of Capcom's arcade action platformer, Magic Sword. The guide gives notes on each of the helpers and maps of the first 30 floors of the tower. Magic Sword is a quarter muncher. It's definitely a game where, with a little bloody mindedness, you can just plow through it in the arcade. Bloody mindedness and a bunch of cash. However, well, the arcade version gives you unlimited continues, rather limited continues, I should say, and as I've stated before, if you're playing the home version of the game, you should be able to set it to effectively free play and get unlimited continues. And what this means is that when the cheap hits come up, and chip hits will come up, because remember, this is a port of a quarter muncher and a fairly faithful one, you're going to be out of luck. It does run into some problems as far as the faithfulness goes and performance goes by getting into slowdown whenever you get any significant number of enemies on screen. That said, I did have fun with this game, and it does deserve a place in your in your collection, and it does have a place in mine. Just come to the table knowing that this game was designed to steal your money, and maybe get a Game Genie or Pro Action Replay so you can give yourself the unlimited continues that you would have if you had an actual stand-up arcade cabinet version of this. We now come to our cover game, Street Fighter II, the game which popularized a genre and in so doing, changed everything. We don't get complete move lists, but we do get notes on each character's strengths and weaknesses, along with notes on performing one or two special moves per character, along with bios and notes on three of the four bosses, Balrog, Vega, and Sagat. I'll say right here, I'm not great at fighting games. So, if this footage 
makes me look like I suck. I kind of do. Anyway, Street Fighter 2 is not, in terms of the bells and whistles, what we normally think of when it comes to fighting games. There are no guard meters or super meters and no super moves. Each character has three special moves that they can use with their own abilities. For example, I can go through opponents with Ryu's Hurricane Kick, but the Hurricane Kick can be countered by jump attacks. I'm not good enough with the Dragon Punch motion to see if enemies can counter it with a standing attack, but it's a great way to counter a uh, jump attack. Now, I expect someone who's more knowledgeable about fighting games than the nitty gritty of them, and stuff like invincibility frames and vulnerability frames and cancels, can get m incredibly more in depth on the just the raw mechanics of Street Fighter 2 and how it differs from other titles on the NES. Still, what I was able to notice is that the game feels a little slower than later titles in the series, or rather plays slower, it doesn't feel slow for me. I was able to get in the game and work with Ryu's speed without feeling like he was sluggish or unresponsive. Ultimately though, the game's strength isn't its single player. If it was just a single player and the multiplayer wasn't any good, it wouldn't have had the life that it had and all the sequels that it had. No, no, its strength is in multiplayer, which, because I'm playing in single player, is also something I can't get too far into. Still, the game feels like a strong port of the arcade game, and I do remember playing a lot of two-player Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo back in the day at friend's house, although I admit I don't remember which revision I played. Wrapping up the game's this issue, we have NCAA Basketball. We have notes on strategies, coaching, and each conference. And I'm disappointed to say the Pac-10 conference is not included in this game. NCAA Basketball really tries to take the Madden approach of simulating the game, as opposed to taking a more arcade like take on the sport. You have full teams of players in the field with some fairly nice animations and no slowdown, and full-length 15-minute quarters. I'm really impressed with the level of detail and how well this game runs. It even incorporates Mode 7 well by rotating the field so whichever side the player is trying to reach is in the front and your team's backcourt is in the back. It took me a little bit to get used to the game's controls, and I still haven't gotten used to the defensive controls, but I was actually able to play a pretty good game of basketball. It's just my main complaint is there's no way to really view or customize the controls in the game so I can kind of better grasp what the controls are before I start playing. And this is something that we've seen in other titles by now, so it's not like it's a new thing. Other than that, I am really bummed by the absence of the Pac-10. All of my local collegiate teams are absent from the game. Boo! In Nestor's Adventures this time, Nestor's playing Dragon Strike, and the tip is that you risk running into things at lower altitudes, which is something that I think was covered in the relevant guide. And if not in the guide, then in the manual. In the now playing column, among the also rans are Shooter Thunder Spirits, Platformer Spanky's Quest, and Brawler Rival Turf. In the top 20 column, Mario still rules the roost, but it still bears mentioning that the most recent Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior games are still on the charts. In the celebrity profile this issue, we have a profile of Tori Spelling, who, as of this issue, is promoting Melrose Place. Tori's career has generally been fine with various myriad TV roles, including, well, Beverly Hills 90210. And Pack Watch, to wrap up this issue, we have a showcase of Super Star Wars and Mario Kart. Also of note in the import title section, we have a look at a game which has not made it to the US in a translated fashion, or in any form or another, at least, yeah in a non-repro cart fashion, and that is the uh, Dragon Ball Z RPG for the Super Famicom. This is actually sort of a compilation of a couple titles for the Famicom, both of which I own, with some considerable gameplay refinements. For my pick of this issue on the two-player front, the clear winner is Street Fighter II. However, for an alternative pick, I have to give a good word to Might and Magic, as the NES version is the version that I would consider superior to the PC version of the game. As a heads up with my new work schedule, I'm going to be slowing my pace down a little bit so I can give each issue the time it needs, and also so I have time to shoot issues of breaking it all down. I won't be slowing down any further than one issue per month, but things will be slower than your, our current fortnightly schedule. 
while things settle down at work. So next time, we've got one of the biggest name apps for the SNES on the cover of the magazine. Not games, apps. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives. If you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down. Well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everyone. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.